Those of you who know me know I usually write these things in my brain somewhere and just talk them, but I have written about Will Alexander before, so I decided to write this out. Will Alexander's more than 30 books speak for themselves, his awards as well. He is not only a poet, novelist, playwright, he is a visual artist, a musician, essayist, and more, and I think uh, he does not always think of these things as separate activities either. He makes connections. For Will Alexander, the nature of matter is as something that cannot be contained as sterilization by plinth, by manipulated allotment or border. And such a view is seen as core to what he calls the Asiatic endogeny, and by extension, Africa with all its stunning oral kingdoms. Not only a matter of peoples, though, but his inclusion takes in the ice fields, wildebeest optics, or the spontaneous hexagrammatics of servals. He may call this inclusion the balaics of the ozone, at the spillage of the sky, which exhales as a burning supraphysical raga. While Alexander points to and from Breton and Miro, making us lean towards surrealism as a concurrent system to his own vision and practice, he is grounded in a wide view of possible science, and his build on the sodium is palpable of those grains of sand Blake speaks about, not an impossible wilderness. He may visit a place where neutron semantics transpires, but his own semantics, while blitzing through cosmological wavelengths, are profoundly palpable. They speak to you. They speak to me. In his infinitely expandable sense of connections, and these are connections across centuries, across continents, across disciplines of thought and action that too many people separate. Battlers against complacency are any of us who hold up notions of free thinking and free mingling of ideas against forces that would resist such roaming. It is a we that not only resists but also conducts. He writes about, and this is from a poem of his, we who plunge through inherent existence, who surmount as beast, restrictive gallstone as landscape, or asps who burn with thriving spittle. It is we who send up smoke through the archives. It is we who live in wakeless daylight threadings so as to throttle the tincture of thankless monsters, so as to reach with our brooding the very chronicles of terror. Andrew Joron writes of Alexander's work, here the imagination, or, excuse me, here the energy of the imagination has not yet been harnessed to the goals of bourgeois subjectivization. Imagination is the conductor of primeval lightning the fiery trickster leaping between frozen and fragmented realia, the universal translator of the multitude of tongues, both human and inhuman, emitted by the signal of signals. At the end of Alexander's play, uh, one of the plays in Inside the Earthquake Palace, a literal volcano is about to burst forth, the late 20th century earthquake of Montserrat. Earthquake includes in its conductions both death and life, and the character in that play, Locato's penultimate words in the play are spoken with a curious joy on his face. As he says, somewhere across the waves, the sun is breaking. I know the sun is breaking. It is like the birth of fire at the end of Alexander's The Sri Lankan Loxodrome. 
where such explosion is like a brimstone fire at the source of the instantaneous. Will Alexander is the closest we have in our community of poets to a jazz master, the hard-won creator of instantaneousness, the transformer of note to harmonics and disharmonics to a music we both can't quite handle and also can't turn away from. Please welcome Will Alexander. Uh, thank you guys for coming and appearing this evening and uh, thank Charles for that introduction. And also thanking uh, Denise for the uh, anointment of interior uh, plasticity, her anointment of interior plasticity. And I wanted to uh, read from an aphorism here. There's a kind of introduction, not to read an aphorism, but it, I say a mirage retriever. I see myself sitting in a sandblasted mud hut a hawk's beak exploding from my mouth with the fatal power of impalement, attacking with a source, sorcerous linguistics that which profanely aligns itself with the exoteric spirit of the Newtonian model. And this Newtonian model is <clears throat> something that's imprisoned us for, for four or five hundred years easily. And we see it in the landscape. I was just coming down Buckeye Road today. This is once Indian territory. Now it's in inert warehouses. Not to be didactic, but the fact is that, that we don't have a living continuum that we're dealing with now. This is why the human race is suffering overtly and more, more silently, more, more invisibly. So what poetry does for me is, is, is invigorate the, 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 the natural neurology of living. Everything has got a neurological field, not just insects. We are losing a lot of insects. I don't want to be ideological, but the fact that we're losing a lot of insects that we don't know anything about. Not just insects, but human beings, languages, you name it. So it's a big slide. So what we're going to do is, I'm not going to read too long, but I'm going to start off with a this New Directions book called The Nexus of Phantoms, which I, I normally read. In a lorikeet cave, motions exist of disintegrated swans. In a translocated lake brimming with harvested poisons sealed by corrupted postmortems. Such swans staggered by microbial reasoning, their aggressive nest anatomical with anomaly, with drifts of strenuous incarnadine leanings, with a thirst which hurdles conspiratorial invasives, alive with coronal oceanics, open like a clouded trail of rendings. <clears throat> Analogous with the auks, the pelicans, the merganses, perhaps with the petrels and the gannets, under the power of darted mocking orations. The swans, looking back on solemn blood perusal, like a form of death breaking roses on a shore. It is the example of phonograms of lost and compacted lenses turning within a charismatic fall line or an isonep or what an avian would announce in Greenland as a catabotic wind. The swans, like a haze of magnetism or implied gondola locations where the scent of each lorikeet is consumed and brought to dazzling eclipse refulgence. In another foci, in another depth, their form self-challenged in a cloak of suns, their power deep revealed with seven moons burning, reduced to two intense incendiary magnets. And these incendiary magnets, like a nexus of phantoms, scattered across a geometric optometry. You know, what I found is that <clears throat> poetry and science don't have to be disarticulated or they can be amalgamated so that the language begins to expand. You know, English has got approximately well, 250,000 words and we've been reduced, like Cindy was saying, like the, 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 um, the, 
humanities, things are being reduced, and at the same time, the language is there to expand us. And I have a theory about that, too. I'll maybe talk a little bit later about English and expansion rather than reduction. But I wanted to read a poem called uh, Water as a Dysphoric Medium. <coughs> Dysphoric means it's uncomfortable. A skittish form in sudden arsenic waters amplified like a smoky savanna form within a black gestation of strata. The water then burns beneath an androgynous source of lilies with each of its moons exploded like garish millipedes in resin. Thought becomes an isotope within hydrology, within an inorganic compound, within the power of its youngest sea, where I imagine in its depths the form of stunning manganese trees or a body of crows trapped within a heated polar ceiling. The depths reverse with their isobars, with their dust counts, like land, land, like land condemned to brutish wheat projection. The biopsies, the oxygen meters, the taste of stunned plankton, like a concentrated polyp from a tribe of spontaneous stellar confinement. The anatomical, the blank global arena of debris, like darted mocking alchemical theory or a dazed selenium hull, or a vaporized borium falling miles and miles to the bottoms, flecked at a level beneath carbonized petroleum beyond that which antedates salt. I'm speaking of energies which ingest the first perfected forms of creation, the primordium of waves, the calligraphy of torment, and so the coelacaths, the vampire fish, the orbits of volcanoes endure. In the timing of the amplitudes, the surges, the gust, like thermal craters which explode and collapse and reabsorb themselves as a fulminant microalgae, as a violent insomnial structure devoid of blood, of insects, of birth. The writhing dunes, the dark conduction of saliva, de-energized by merging, then thought to bear then brought to bear upon the fruit of infertilized deltas. So for me, every, every word is a summons. Each, 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 each word creates magnetism. In existence, every act should create some kind of magnetism, hopefully for a positive thinking pattern, not a negation. But see, if we think about what's right in front of us, we don't get the whole picture. This is what the indigenous understanding is giving you the whole picture, not the fragmented picture. It was many reasons for 1492, but the, the tragedy is the reduction of human, the reduction of the human neural system under the rubric of a, of a, of a, of a singular fragment. So for me, I've never been able to do much singular thinking in terms of a, uh, what's required, you know, thinking in terms of the logical or the linear aspect of, of what reality is about. It's a lot more than a house. But the fact is that there's a gentleman from years ago, and his work should be re-energized and brought to bear. These are just exercises, it's not a book. It's a, it's a, I use this in teaching, it's called a lateral thinking talks about the different forms of the way the mind can be used. Not just, linear thinking is one way, it is a way of using it, that, but we've been using that as an exclusive fundament. But if you go to other cultures, we're talking about Japan or other parts of the world, Africa, you find other ways that the mind has been employed. And if we can start to employ those alternatives, it'll give us, what I consider to be a, a, a neurological opening that's collective, collective. I mean, not just, not as a manifesto, but as a, as a power to conduct energy. You know, we're not conducting enough energy because we, we're tied up. That, that's what illness is about, is the fact that the, the ducks are tied up all the time. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to liberate verbal ducks. And so <laughs> this is a, 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 a poem that's, some time ago, it's, I call it a cursory note on pre-existence, and this is something that uh, 
it's a it's a longer piece, but uh, hopefully we will be able to work with it. And um, after ultimate test and burnings, the spore of space, runic, anti-empirical of diurnal fatigue. It remains fleeting, marked by a geometric hydrogen, by a stunningly expressed coma, scorched by omegas in voltage, by plain societies of vermin, by mental monorons of evil. One thinks of plagues aligned with tragic portions of ennui, with poison theories of fractals condensed in photonic, photonic dissolution, within plagiarized tension as courage, sung by the human ambit as motionless blazed, stilled in dissension. Yes, as a gamble quaking in crystal across a tumultuous graft of boiling emanation, the syntax voltage, the sudden symbols of pre-existence with its dazzling suns, with its monomial griffins like an elusive vertigo of grams. So that each species of bacteria, an osmotic trembling, a suma as body as emergence from explosive helium soil, so that each greenish scroll of blood, each bite becomes no more than the analytical transparency of life attempted in a concentrated grain, which wields its force against the power of preternatural wandering, so that like the Newtonian notion of wood becomes of utmost isolation of a petrified John Darn as mirage imbued with resistance of that which haunts its ilk with a heightened utopian famine with testitudinous neural shiftings within the optic depth of a trenchant waking motive. Thus, there is war between such sobriety and the malefic and the magical force of its dialectical grace. The malefic condemned to a listless northern skeletal retreat, yet at grace partaking of blank imaginal worlds of enigmatic calcination and risk where its pyramids alive with signals eclipsing post-mortem brine. A fabulous phantom kinetic above a barbarous lake of entrails in dialogue with a black looming bird casting spells within the flame of a puzzling immunity. A pretemporal existence incalcitrant, incalcitrant as to the palpable, so as, as to the gust of deserts as to the stoma of seas. All the humanity of lynxes and dolphins rife and simultaneous with the precondition of Saturn, with the protocolescence of Venus, their phantom marks floating across critical Uranian sierras, not visually inscripted, not bold with umbilical infusion or coeval with eidetic methane charisma, as in an arbitrary vacuum where a necessitous dromedary language is replete with prolific nullification, with absence, with a vapor of angularity, as though moons had erupted from a shaking foundation of endless beta decay. Of course, the mind can concur upon a liminal inhalant of menace, upon subtractive mineral behemoths, who can then claim no post-existence from a death in ordained lands. In pre-creation, the vivid locale of a neutron suspended and I determined so that that which subsists is of no apparent gravity, of lack of boundaries subsumed in its culpable masses and masses partaking of the glossary of Newtonian ice and steam. But the field as aboriginal aurora as the bloodless comedic body, as rotating innuendo, as weightless sojourn, as achromatic compound, being mass at rest, rising above the central vision of phenomena. Each axial shift of prone calendrical hazard, a writing of a fire which confounds its deceptive germination, in listless grace, in blank mechanics and arcana, 
spun in dark lithography of granite. The force of dispersed weight of overturned resistance, a flameless tourmaline invention, interconnected by a wave of inscrutable hexagrams, rayless, yet combined with an, an odd salamandrine, salamandrine electrics, then scattered as syllogistic meridians, the future, an inconsolable ebullience, the past, that which negates the sociology of opprobrium, the present being a mental subatomic, a human vehicular fuel, then the void and its basic body of broken lines, no longer of mental translucence, no longer of alien reasoning hives, condensed as it is outside the desolate isomorphic of a mirrored concentration. To me, the, the science and the, 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 the back. <laughs> uh, the boundaries for me have never existed. And they went, well, boundaries for me were, boundaries are, are, are part of the educational process in, in the Occident. For me, I've never had this, for some reason, none of the boundaries became isolate for me. And as a consequence, I was never, I, I was never a student of, of any consequence because of that. But, you know, what happened for me was when I was able to liberate myself and go beyond boundaries. And <clears throat> something Octavio Paz said in 1956 about the collapsing of genre. And I took that to heart. It's in this book called um, The Bow and the Lear. 1956, he talked about the, the, the different forms of the genres being, you know, they should, be, they should be ingrained and put together. And people like Matrimon had done this, pre-surrealism. But, you know, I was looking at this whole concept of uh, surrealism, and like all of existence, it's it improvised, it's not static. When we go back to the earliest to Egyptians, pre-Egyptian, uh, what is the methodology of the mind, you know, where the study of the mind, I should say, where, where the, uh, the hypnosis and, and, and intervention took place. And this is done in the Islamic cultures far, far in, 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 in for, you know, the interpretation of dreams. I was in German, the Trump tongue. Um, 1903, but this has been done in, in, in the Cordoba in, in, in the 900s by a gentleman named um, Najab Uddin Muhammad. They were, they were cataloging in the mind in, in the 950s. So don't tell me about this or that. It's nothing is new. I mean, it's the old biblical saying is nothing new under the sun. <laughs> so we've been categorized and especially the, uh, the, in fact, in something like mechanical devices, I mean, like street lighting, you know, that was announced in, 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 in England in, in the 1350s, but not implemented into the, until the 1800s. But you go back to Cordoba, you find this thing happening. So I'm talking to, in the 900s. So you're talking about integrating these areas into the human system, not the, the, the situation that's going on today where we have our, our, our colleagues down here, human colleagues down here at, at, at the border, not miles away from here. So, I want to continue with a, um, a um, thought that's philosophical torment. Huh? Wow, when you think a lot, it makes you uncomfortable sometimes. <laughs> because, you know, we're dealing with consensus understanding all the time. And it, uh, reality should be an experiment. It's like, you, Denise was doing an experiment, a plastic experiment. That's what drama is, it's plasticity and ferment. This is called thought as philosophical torment. In the mirror of excessive drift, there exists those values which exist within schisms, within error rack spectrums, which glow by means of vapor above anti-dimensional obstruction the visage of metrics tuned to a mesmeric lisp, to a rancid facial dice thrown across ethers, across three or four sierras or voids. 
so that each sculpting, each prism advances the aboriginal understanding to a macro-positional scalding which collapses, which takes on the centigrade of absence bound to invisible camaraderie, which means velocity is obscured and resurrected beyond the scope of a, of a positional turquoise, beyond the scope which defines its way as jaundice by a circular language as dragon. The face and the scope of the millipedes no longer condone to withdrawal to persecution as flaw or advancement. For instance, the blank theogony of vowels or the inhomophony of, of, of distance like an open vibrational nerve or the hissing of ruins in a buried nautical port. One thing's of a sublimated, mount, a sublimated mountain illness contradicted as in a reddish form of dysentery. And in each intrinsic nuance, all the symmetries obscured, the maps one comes to know are but boulders which are shattered by spoilage. Therefore, the fragments hung in peninsulas or suspended, and the visage in its demeanor like a deingested shrine subsumed in the body as a rudderless coherence. So to you know, use language is, 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 is an opening, not a, not a restrictive, to be corrected on a paper, but to use the experiment to, to widen the space. There's a great, we're talking about jazz music, there's, there was a, a, you may not know this great jazz trumpeter played with the great Ari Dolphy in 1961. They did this great, they call it the great concert, but it was in the, at the five spot, the old five spot in New York. And Booker was dying from a crazy disease called uremia, where, where somehow the kidneys leak and spill urine into the blood. It's weird. And he was dying from this, but he was playing this, this, this great music all up to the end. So we gotta do it all, all the way to the end. Um, and I'm not saying that, but you do it, you do it. So Booker says, this, he says he didn't believe in, in obstructions. You know, he believed in the plasticity of sound. You know, you don't have to just do a, with notes within a certain range, but you can spill outside of that. And that was one of the ignitions of, you know, we're talking about Arnett Coleman, Eric Dolphy, John Coltrane, opening up the neurology now. You know, we're not talking about what it, is it to, Look at the moon out there. It's different. It's part of, but it's part of our our, our, our reality. So you know, if, if it's an insect out there or, or somebody, it, it, it's 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 a person of, of Indian heritage. Why are they so demeaned? You demean yourself. Is what Suzanne says when the the colonizer is the colonized. You're trapped. We're all trapped. So how do we liberate ourselves from quotidian thinking? That's what I'm attempting to do in some of this work. So, um, and what I do, I never, I never prescript any reading. I myself don't know what I'm going to read. So it keeps keeps everything going. I don't prepare. I'm not a. I'm not. A, I don't check, cross my T's, and dot my eyes. Not good for consciousness. This is the title piece from this book called Above the Human Nerve Domain, and this is the title piece. And uh, it says, to unlock predisposives in carbon. We'll wait till these quotidian guys go away. I know they need to go and deliver goods, but it's an inopportunity. break up but we'll come back now it's, it's time to go okay it's called above the human nerve domain to unlock predisposers in carbon to cancel sleep as poetical drachma not as transaxial summa or intense aboriginal invasive but as promenade as forgery by craft as assault aboriginal anagram yes as a dark stochastic wheat drained of its magic as drift, being boundary, being hellish invention as grasp. I'm thinking of aroused electrical blockage, of human monsoon killing as treaty, as breach, as strangled impulse by identity. 
I mean the psychic root which is sustained by dialogical, dialectical illness, by the thought of con by the thought contained in black ozonal mirrors where general slaughter is reflected, where the mind impels its wits by bleak molecular isolation, by stunted mangrove as withdrawal, by absence from the life of euphoric solar trees. Such prone negation imploded from the realms of a suicide boundary, of broken wisdom as diamond. It is an eon of fallen snow in a well. An injudicious barrier gone awry, the ingrained Eurocentric example of the hatred of the darker integument with its combative belligerence against the core of volition, volitional mystery. So that what concerns me is a yoga which implodes the sun, which compounds its runics, the body then electric like a stunning sapphire serpent with the arc of its cells alive as interior altar species, as an eye of analogical waters. No longer of ennui, of the praxis of perfidious helium atrocity, extended by the vapor of betrayal, by the dazed imperceptives in the molecules. Here in such preternatural enclave, I swim in the murmur of sun dogs, of kindled potentate spasms, like interior distillation from Moorish pre-Copernica. As if at the height of comedic day there existed the dauntless Sphinxian geometries, those pre-existent personas of lightning, no longer of the form of gravity as bastion, of lingering ammonia in the genes, but of absent chemical flaw, the body becoming the magic flight of a transmuted corium of the bell of a bloodless liminal amber. And this is um, another piece called, <clears throat> from this volume called Provision for the Higher Ozone Body. How do we extend our capacities as human beings? Not through going to the gym, but that's part of it too. The psychobiology, but not just the, the mind and the body, but together. We heard a lot about this, you know, about the mind and the body going together. But, you know, we've been educated to separate everything out. I know for certain. I, you know, I was I was ill just that far away from. Is, is the old persuader song says that much from being dead, <laughs> but uh, in a state of shock. You know, that's the old old old. What do you call it? We used to call it in the hood slow dance music. <laughs> but you know, it's just in, interesting enough. I was close, and you know, it, it, it was it's something that, that allowed me to see things in a certain way. You don't take things for granted. And not, not to be a, a, to use the, the term hard ass, but to be a person that's aware of what's going on. Because, you know, this is, a, this is the problem with the monotony of being in a particular generation. <laughs> it becomes a monotony rather than a reality. Because you get stuck in these places. People are stuck and they go back in time and they can only relate to, uh, the, the mentality of a, of a former time, but they're not in a continuum where they're exercising their total reality. There was a there was a nursing home. I'll, I'll read a poem after that. I say this, but there was a nursing home in Boston. They uh, they they did these, these these experiments on the mind, and they they, they they replaced everything. I won't let them get in my way, but. What, what they did was they did these experiments with the people that were there. And uh, their nuisances, I won't let them stop me. What they, what they did was this. They took all of the TVs out and put black and white TVs in there. And they showed old, old pictures of uh, old, old boxing matches of Floyd Patterson and people like that. And after about two weeks, and there seemed to be more life in the population in the, in, in the nursing home. In other words, they could relate to that. But if you open that up and you start to open the whole spectrum up, I mean, you'd be comfortable anywhere. It, it won't be a, a limit that, that you're operating out of. So this is the idea for me is to get into this higher, higher space that a gentleman named, uh, he's from uh, Mario Martinez from Uruguay, talks about this. Putting your mind in a space where you don't 
get into consensus, conjoinment with, with your own uh, negation. Now, that's a fancy way of saying, don't get stuck in the past. <laughs> so anyway, this, is, this poem is called Provision for the Higher Ozone Body. A beaker of yeast on a phantom blood horizon sustaining my stoma, my triangular body as hearth while imbibing hyperphrenia in the void of a dusty electrical house. Alive in a vanished ozone square like a magic hydrogen beast in a jewel, honing my priority to elevated ferret to quantifiable opacity in that I'm able to hunt for trout in plentiful, plentiful sucrose heat in fiery ratios of bark in gulfs of angry neutron data. Because I claim the fructose of flesh with splinters, I agree upon darkened chemical plans to take away sequentials, to reinforce the blood which ignites the omniscient smoke of ritual Cherokee spiders. Much like the power to secretly ingest hemp, to curiously spill waters feasting within the sands of alchemical Polynesias, within blazing stochastics, eating sheets of hawk or anomalous dandelion lashings or ice from cold cilantro chowders. Or say, I drink blood from a haphazard sparrow or swallow peppers from a swirling Mongolian leper's nest. I'm linked to primordial kerosene as example, to floods, to symbols of Assyrian hunting assemblage. This placed and obsessed with contaminated grammar, which forfeits prophetic war, or the force of Uranian cobalt fragments, I mellifluously rise into higher thermal assertion by placing intuitive stones around the sink of explosive shadows. I then re-engender the bottomless, or make two or three bickerings of ice vanish into the source of Mexican agua. There then exists the eating of, eating of lions on behalf of the alchemical hurricane body, on behalf of its higher levitational beryllium, its claws, its emblems eclectic, of eclectic butane and voltage. And it is this voltage by which one staggers like an amethyst fish, like a monstrous chaparral of limits on fire with that which annuls the lower gold to a higher state of buffeted emergence. As if under the camouflage of cataracts, I were to dwell on glassy vertigo soils compelled by roaring anodyne volcanoes. Every reason exists to impose my scrolls on blank omega worms. Therefore, being able to breathe at living volational scale, life as a spurious mirror what must be empty, must transcend the flaw in piacular bullocks so that the bulk, the monorons, the chasms will emit as a oracular bounty, a salt, a distance prince capable of a less at the pitch of the transmuted ozone body. And this whole idea of transmutation of language, of transmutation of the being, that one has to take a kind of a, a leap, almost a leap to take on these these other properties of this other these other plasticities, plasticities of possibility. And the best way to, to me to do it is language. It was one of the great yogins I've just discovered was one that did this plasticity of yoga, of yoga through language. Swami Ramalingan. Ramalingan. Nobody's heard of him. Amazing stuff. 1851. You know, and see, that's another problem, too, that, that, that our, 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 our minds have been cut off in 1945. Oh, we know it's too old. Hmm. You know, that, that's crazy because you know, it's as if you were, you know, exonerated from, from living and you, you put into an advertiser's box, you know, like the advertiser's box from uh, uh, Bernays, 1923, which we've been put in for a while, you know. By the way, air conditioning came in in, in about 23, 24. So we're not that far off. In fact, between 1923 and, and 19... 70, according to this historian, I didn't get his name. I heard his interview, he says between 1923 and 1971, there hasn't been much done, even though we have all these electronic devices.
devices. But the basic idea of the typewriter, everything is the same, basically the same. You've taken out billboards and put up electronic, but what, what's transmuted from the inside? Much of nothing, in fact, it's devolving. We're just talking about China today. You know, the, the devolution on the planet Earth is, is astonishing. So we have to uh, continue to move in a direction. And I'm gonna finish up with this, this piece on the, on the forming substance of Orishas. You know, the African ideas of the intelligence and telepathy and language. All of these fields formed out of Africa, which is completely denied. I mean, we go into philosophy departments, you get to the pre-Socratics, but where did they come from? How long did Pythagoras and people like that stay in, in Egypt? Years and years. There's in Herodotus and some of the people talked about the actual teachers of, of, um, of Pythagoras in, in Egypt. Not much is talked about that. In fact, it becomes radical because it's African. <laughs> so, yeah, so we're, 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 we're going to spin in on this poem here. It goes on the forming substance of Orishas. Like spectral glass or music in hypnotic palindrome, I float in measureless unus ambo as if up a flight of refracted shale I had greeted my own collusion. My quaking appoggiatura in morose Dunic empyreans in a darkened gradient ideal in a treatise on immortal monsoon and storment. Yes, on combined ammonia and sand by extracting dye from bitter surgical causes, by flames monstrously modified by treason, as if I threw from my optics a blizzard of dice, a transformed connivance, and flew spellbound into the jeopardous range of dense Judaic gods. Who change forms, who variate as monsters, as plagues, as ghosts who block the sun door. So my Orishas imprison the instantly locked who advance and retreat by phantom creosote vibration, by prayer as aboriginal containment. Therefore, the sun, a lucid castral flambeau, appearing in fictitious scintilla like a specter or draught with both its ciphers missing, again appearing as a blood-drenched duenna, as a life and death rotation, as a quintessential acid. And so my Orishas, with their double throat of a billion ethers, flying across runic withdrawal, flying as obscured pariahs, alive as if sulfuric bithyism were shattered with its laws, with its manacles, with its phantoms. And my Orishas, with their sputum-colored auras, with their eyes of tortured hurricane moons, as flailing solitary gats, as quintessential duplicity, part quadrant and part yellow, and I, with my lustrous looking glass pigment, with my roving heretical elixir. And so there's thirst, there are surreptitious muffling powders, and the deities with their scattered wounding teeth watch my oresis turn shadow and vanish and continue to hum within my voice as in a glass of old veronal brew. Now, as dialectical advantage, as high above deistic moral chambers, their winged singular fate, free to roam inscrutable havens, beyond the fact of an insular neutron thesis, beyond the trait of canonic barrier as reversion. I thank you.